Matthew Wilkinson, historian with Heritage Mississauga, and it's my pleasure to bring to you another in our series of uh, presentations regarding the fascinating history and heritage of the city of Mississauga. Um, today's presentation uh, from Heritage Mississauga is entitled The Lay of the Land. Um, 2020 marks a bicentennial of two treaties between the indigenous Mississaugas and the British Crown. Uh, treaties 22 and 23 uh, signed in February of 1820. Um, and we're going to look at, uh, at uh, the process of indigenous treaties um, and uh, the, the foundation stones, if you will, for the, the geographic layout of the landscape that would become the city of Mississauga. Uh, particularly, we're going to focus on the, the two treaties signed in 1820, treaties 22 and 23, and the development of something called the Racy Tract. Uh, and some of the reminders of this, this period of time that uh, remain on our landscape uh, to this day. Um, just making some connections uh, of, of uh, kind of places we know and, and are part or are visibly part of the city of Mississauga today from an everyday perspective of those that drive and walk on these streets. Um, you might uh, know around, centered around the, the Credit River and Dundas Street uh, just a little bit uh, to uh, away from Mississauga Road, you'll find the village of Arendale, and here's a plaque erected by the city of Mississauga, just in front of the Arendale Community Hall, uh, commemorating the village uh, itself, and uh, in, in, in very loose terms, tying it to uh, the treaty process with uh, uh, the indigenous Mississaugas, and to an individual by the name of Thomas Racy. Uh, Arendale is situated within an area of land that at one point was known as the Racy Tract. Um, part of the challenge when you put a plaque in the ground is uh, it ceases to become kind of an editable document. Uh, they, they become etched in stone, or in this case, uh, words that are etched in, uh, in uh, aluminum. Um, and uh, when we don't quite have the narrative uh, correct, uh, they become part of the vernacular and uh, you know, they're, they're a product of their time. This plaque was erected in the, in the early 1980s. Uh, our understanding of that time uh, has, has evolved. Uh, research has a greater, uh, more in-depth research and more in-depth re resources have become available. Um, and uh, this plaque refers to Thomas Racy being unable to make his payments. Um, that was never the case. So we now know uh, and understand that Thomas Racy was a government land agent who simply reassigned elsewhere. He spent the length of his career, the majority of the rest of his career, as a land registrar in Halton County. Uh, and the mysterious Mr. Racy, who we knew uh, historically very little about originally, we know a great deal more now, uh, is buried quietly in, uh, in, uh, in Hornby, just outside of uh, of, uh, of Georgetown. Um, and uh, as the plaque in Arundel uh, suggests that he left in disgrace, that does not appear to be the case. And so there's a, the only reason I may highlight uh, these kinds of things is we're, we're not always certain that what we, we believe to be the case was actually the case. Um, and history is, it can be complicated. There can be many layers in those stories. And we're going to unravel some of those layers in this, uh, this presentation. Uh, uh, we'll interact with the, the modern landscape in ways perhaps that uh, people driving and, and walking on the landscape today um, don't realize the connections to the past that we have that are visible and, uh, and uh, on our landscape on an everyday perspective. Um, stepping back in time, um, there are modern reminders on our landscape uh, today that connect to those, those beyond just plaques and things that mention it. There's some road names, there's historic buildings. And, I always say wherever you, you live in the city of Mississauga, someone has certainly lived there before, maybe not uh, in the same house, uh, but certainly on the same land. People have walked on this landscape for thousands of years. Uh, people have interacted with uh, with the landscape before the roads were, were paved, our oldest road being Dundas Street, uh, surveyed in 1796. Um, but our, our backbones to our, our geographic landscape that we know today uh, from a roadscape perspective uh, date to in the southern part of Mississauga to 1806. Um, we have intersections in our landscape that have been on the landscape as an intersection uh, for well over 200 years. And so again, people have walked and interacted with this landscape and shaped the land and the land has shaped people for hundreds and thousands of years. Um, and so it, it, understanding our history is also coming into terms with the evolution of the place and the evolution of the land on which this place sits. Um, again, how people have shaped the land and how land has shaped the people. 
Um, and it's, it's an ever, uh, an ongoing process. Um, it's something that does not arrest in time and uh, never is it a static process either. Uh, there's always an element of change involved and that uh, is part of the challenges and joys of history of trying to connect to those challenges and, 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 uh, and changes in time um, and how they shape the identity of this place and the people who called it home. Uh, whether we're dealing with indigenous people or, or those that came after, um, landscape always plays a role in, uh, in understanding of life and times of people. Uh, the treaty period uh, itself is a, 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 a broad area of time where we, we look at the interactions between British Crown officials and the Indigenous peoples who lived in, in southern Ontario. And the Crown was uh, following the American Revolution. Um, the Crown in North America, here in Canada, I should say, uh, was very much involved with acquiring land prior to the advance of uh, of non-Indigenous settlement. Um, and uh, they entered into a series of negotiations with the Indigenous Mississaugas along the North Shore of Lake Ontario, principally between the Humber River and, uh, and uh, the Credit River, the Tobago Creek, of course, in there, the, all the way to Stony Creek. Um, and so this becomes kind of the focal point of a number of treaties that are, are agreed upon between the British Crown and the Indigenous Mississaugas. One of the challenges was uh, at the time, and even in our own concepts today, our, our understanding the different concepts of land ownership. Um, to the indigenous Mississaugas, land was neither an item of booty to be won or lost, nor a commodity to be bought or sold, but rather a gift from the maker that was necessary for survival and that people uh, were responsible for at the time they were using it and they're all equally responsible for passing it on and making sure that the land remained bountiful. They were bound to it. Uh, there is a, a common respect and a common uh, concept of, of uh, land stewardship to use a modern term. To the British Crown, however, land treaties were uh, binding uh, legal documents of ownership. Uh, a very different concept and one of which uh, uh, concept that uh, the indigenous Mississaugas at first did not come to understand that uh, what that meant from a European sense of ownership. Um, to, the Euro uh, to European eyes or to, to non-indigenous eyes, uh, land was a saleable commodity. Um, it was uh, something that was quantifiable and um, uh, created a system of what's mine and what's yours. People put up fences and erected roads and and the like, where for Indigenous people that was a little bit of an alien concept in the early years. And so there's a, an unequal footing in terms of the negotiations that are taking place and the agreements that are being reached. Uh, the, the Mississaugas will not remain very long in, in not understanding what the British were doing in terms of acquiring land. But nonetheless, these, these early treaties we can see uh, essentially, we would use the terms of being signed in poor faith or bad faith. Uh, the British Crown knew that the Mississaugas did not know what they were doing in terms of British legal terms and, and, uh, and uh, ideas. And so the, the treaty period is uh, casts a dark shadow over um, the understanding of the evolution of our landscape. And then uh, right up to the modern era, we see reparations being made between our, our federal government and indigenous peoples for um, trying to, to uh, right the wrong uh, that was done in a uh, spirit of bad faith so many years ago. Um, the treaties, when we begin to look at the individual treaties themselves and how they come to shape the very backbone of the landscape that would become the city of Mississauga, uh, there's a number of treaties that are signed between uh, the British Crown and the Indigenous Mississaugas. Uh, the 1787-1788 Toronto Purchase uh, was signed on a board ship uh, outside the Bay of Quinty, um, and it was very vague in terms. In fact, it, uh, it uh, was not signed at the time, or at least it was not filled out, and it looks like the chief uh, totems were fixed after the fact. Um, and so this, this document uh, became problematic. It was more of a verbal agreement that was never uh, fully uh, uh, written down and recorded. Um, it uh, uh, is said to have transferred land from the head of the lake uh, around what is now uh, the Topical Creek all the way to the Bay of Quinty, a vast area of land, to a depth of land a man could walk in six days. Uh, the Mississaugas were given clothing, guns, powder, ammunition, a thousand pounds province currency uh, in exchange for this vast acreage of land. The only challenge was um, the lack of 
clarity as to how much and what exactly the land was that was agreed to uh, in 1787 and 1788. Um, these are happening amidst a change of times. Um, the, the treaties are coming about after uh, a number of monumental changes here in, uh, in North America. Beginning in the 1760s, you have the fall of New France and the beginning of the, the, the British occupation of, of British North America, what would become Canada. Of course, at the time, uh, the, uh, the, the colonies in the United States have not yet seceded, but they will come the American Revolution in the 1780s. And following that, you have a great deal of turmoil of, of those who would be uh, uh, remain British citizens but are living in the continent of the United States. After the United States gains their freedom, they become refugees. Uh, we know them today as the United Empire Loyalists, but they're coming north. Um, they're looking for uh, uh, shelter, if you will, uh, and resettlement under British rule in, in what would become Canada. Um, and uh, the, at this time, Upper and Lower Canada, what would later become Ontario and Quebec are created, well, Quebec is already created, but Ontario is carved out of that as Upper Canada as a, as a, as a province created for Loyalist settlements, and the Maritimes are tied into that as well. Uh, being a little vague on the Loyalist settlement, that's another topic, and, and we can talk to in greater detail another time, but uh, certainly the, the Loyalist settlement period uh, starting to shape the landscape that would become uh, Ontario and, and ultimately Mississauga as well. We certainly have our early ties to the little settlement as well. But at this time, what the British Crown is doing is engaging in a series of negotiations to acquire land from the Indigenous peoples, including the Indigenous Mississaugas, in advance of the settlement that is coming northwards. Um, at the end of 1805, um, a series of negotiations are held, the, uh, um, sorry, at the end of July in, uh, in 1805. Um, Crown representatives meet with the principal chiefs of the Mississaugas at the mouth of the Credit River, uh, just outside of a building known as the Government Inn, um, which was the first building to be built and was within what is today uh, the city of Mississauga. It was built on the banks of the Credit River uh, south of Lakeshore Road. Uh, in the 1790s, and again known by as the government in. Um, and this was a location that was chosen for the Crown representatives to meet and to discuss acquisition of further land or cessation of further land by the Indigenous uh, Mississaugas. Uh, there's an artist's rendition of the negotiations and ultimate uh, treaty signing. Uh, the principal individuals involved were uh, Sir William Klaus, the Deputy Superintendent of Indian Affairs. Um, uh, of the Indian Department and uh, Chief Bob Kinnean amongst uh, uh, the, the several other principal chiefs of the Mississaugas um, who uh, met uh, at the end of July of 1805 to negotiate a further land uh, land treaty. Um, they agreed on a couple, they made a couple of agreements uh, during the course of these, uh, these negotiations. The first one being Treaty 13, which was signed on October 1st of 1805. And Treaty 13 was an affirmation of the blank treaty that had been signed at the Bay of Quinte that I referenced earlier. Um, they realized, the government uh, realized that the, the treaty that was uh, not filled out or not filled out completely or correctly would call it, would be problematic. And so they entered into a, a negotiation to um, uh, affirm that, uh, that earlier treaty and that is known as Treaty 13 or the Toronto Purchase. Um, and the very following day, uh, that's August 1st, 1805, on August 2nd, 1805, Provisional Agreement, uh, Treaty 13A, Treaty 13 Addendum, uh, is signed on August 2nd of 1805. And this involves what would become the city of Mississauga. Uh, Treaty 13A covers a uh, 74,000 acres of land stretching from the Etobicoke Creek to uh, Burlington Bay to a depth of six miles. Uh, that six mile mark today is marked by Eglinton Avenue through, uh, through Mississauga. So everything south of Eglinton Avenue excluding um, uh, the uh, one mile tract on each side of the Credit River, as well as land around the mouths of the 12 and 16 mile creek in the Etobicoke Creek. But principally we're looking at the, uh, the set of setting aside of the one mile on each side of the Credit River, and this will come back into our story a little bit. Uh, so that's Treaty 13A that was signed August 2nd of 1805. Um, that treaty uh, as an addendum, as a, uh, as a provisional treaty, was affirmed uh, in Treaty 14, which was signed September 5th of 1806, known officially as the Head of the Lake Purchase. Uh, so that's Treaty 14 is the affirmation of Treaty 13A. Um, and uh, 
that again, one mile each side of the Credit River is set aside as well as a 200 acre reserve uh, along the banks of the Credit River, which would become known as the Credit Indian Reserve. And uh, we will deal with that in time as well. So that's Treaty 14, the Head of the Lake Purchase um, from Etobicoke Creek all the way to Burlington Bay, 74,000 acres of land. Um, following that uh, that treaty, you have the the Crown Surveyors coming in, uh, although in, uh, in European eyes or, or non-Indigenous eyes, this is a wilderness. Um, it, uh, it will be an ordered wilderness from a surveyor's perspective, perspective. and they, they use a cadastral survey uh, into long uh, rectangle lots, 200 acres in size, with two fronts fronting on, a, on the street at the front and the back of the property, and you can see from this, uh, this copy of the map uh, from, uh, from uh, the Samuel Wilmot survey of 1806, known as the old survey of Toronto Township, uh, Toronto Township is a historic name for the city of Mississauga, of course, uh, and it's arrayed in these long, skinny 200-acre lots of land, excluding the one-mile strip on each side of the Credit River, which is clearly evident uh, at, uh, on the map. And that square down at the uh, at the bottom of the of the, uh, the the Credit River, down towards where it says Lake Ontario, that's noting the government in location. Uh, so the, the first building to be built there. Some of the other things you'll see here, you'll see things like uh, crosses, uh, which are uh, clergy reserves um, and uh, school reserves, as well as masting lots. Those would be the M's uh, on there. And so the land that's set aside as traditional uh, traditional means. Uh, laid out in, in this survey so that we have the the old survey of Toronto Township the Samuel Wilmot survey registered in 1806. Um, a few years later uh, following the war of 1812 and uh, initial settlement in the south part of Mississauga south of Eglinton Avenue excluding that one mile each side of the Credit River um, the British Crown and the Mississaugas uh, negotiate a another treaty and this involves all the land north of Eglinton Avenue, 648,000 acres of land, uh, signed October 20th of 1818, known as the Agitus Treaty. Um, and the Agitus Treaty is, uh, is it conveys a vast acreage of land, again, to the, to the British Crown for uh, settlement of non-Indigenous peoples. Um, and then only a couple of years later, uh, here we are in 1820, uh, treaties 22 and 23 are signed, um, and again, this is the, uh, the 200th anniversary of, of, of the signing of these treaties this year. Known, as, known uh, together as the credit treaties, this involved principally the land that had been set aside in that first treaty of 1805 along the one mile stretch of the Credit River, as well as the lands of the, the 12 and 16 mile creeks and so on. Um, but the, here we have uh, some documents pertaining to the credit treaties of February 28th of 1820. Uh, so when we look at uh, the uh, the boundaries, if you will, of the treaties today, the, the Southern Ontario is uh, 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 be speckled by different treaty arranger agreements between the British Crown and the Indigenous Mississaugas or other Indigenous people as well, including the Haudenosaunee. Um, but uh, principally where we're looking here, uh, we are involved with uh, essentially four different treaties in the ge geographic landscape of what is today the city of Mississauga. Um, they would be uh, uh, Treaty 13A slash Treaty 14, uh, the head of the Lake Treaty that is south of Eglinton Avenue, North of Eglinton Avenue is the Adjutant's Treaty, signed in 1818, and then along the one mile on each side of the Credit River, you have the uh, the Credit Treaties of Treaties 22 and 23, signed in 1820. Um, this essentially opens up uh, all the land of what is now the city of Mississauga for non-Indigenous settlement. Um, uh, excluding a small portion of land that was set aside as a credit Indian reserve until 1846. And we'll, we'll deal with that in a few moments as well. Uh, again, just looking at the geographic landscape, uh, if you will, and that's a uh, portion of Peel and Fulton counties and beyond, uh, just looking at kind of the, the color, acre, uh, color areas and how much acreage was involved, but we're dealing with vast, vast uh, geographic acreages. Um, it's hard to put your, your mind around how much land were actually involved in uh, these uh, these uh, treaty uh, um, arrangements or treaty agreements that were signed between the Indigenous Mississaugas and the British Crown. Um, the credit treaties themselves, uh, they they principally look. Uh, we're, we're going to look along the one mile of each side of the Credit River, um, north and south of Dundas Street. Uh, a treaty twenty two covered. 
um, and the center section along Dundas Street uh, to a depth of one uh, half concession for north and south of Dundas. Treaty 23 uh, will cover those sections. And tre Treaty 23 is what becomes known as the Racy Tract. And again, we'll deal with that in a few moments. Um, the credit treaties themselves, so just coming to terms with uh, the bicentennial of this moment in time. Uh, the signatories of it were uh, William Klaus, uh, Deputy Superintendent General of Indian Affairs, um, uh, James Given, Super, Superintendent of Indian Affairs. Th these are also uh, quasi-military treaties as well. These are, these are treaties based on, I guess, historical alliances, uh, military alliances. Um, and uh, the military is represented by the 68th Light Regiment uh, stationed at uh, Fort York in Toronto, um, but they are present as well, and they're the, some of the officers signed the document as well. Uh, the Mississaugas themselves were represented by uh, a number of their chiefs uh, along uh, the Credit River, uh, Ashton and uh, being the most uh, uh, senior of the chiefs, uh, known as adjutants, adjutant or Captain Jim. Uh, also another known as Okuma Paness, who signed the Treaty of 1805, he'd be an elderly uh, uh, chief at that point, uh, went by the English name of John Cameron. Um, and then uh, William Gruitt, the, uh, the interpreter, of, uh, and probably the individual involved with, uh, with uh, negotiating uh, most of the interpretation of, of uh, of the, the discussions going back and forth between the parties. Um, but there is a, a close-up of the document that was signed uh, in uh, February of 1820. Um, the promises um, uh, that were, were laid out as, as part of these credit treaties were uh, to provide the Mississaugas with Christian education, uh, religion, and training them with farming. Uh, 200 acres were to be set aside for a future village site. A village was eventually built a few years later. Uh, was adjacent to, but not directly in that 200 acre reserve, but uh, we'll talk about that in a few moments. Um, 9,500 acres of land were ceded to the Crown, a portion of which was retained by the Crown as a credit Indian reserve for their use. Uh, the Crown would hold on to that for uh, just over 25 years. Um, the, uh, they were compensated uh, 20 shillings in Treaty 22 and 50 pounds province currency in Treaty 23. Um, again, that is uh, not uh, 50 pounds, 20 shillings for 9,500 acres of land. It uh, was a bargain basement price, to say the least, that the Crown was willing to offer uh, for the land that was, uh, that was given up in treaty. Um, so just understanding kind of the, the, the lay of the geographic landscape once the treaties are signed and the surveyors come through. Um, the trees that were signed in 1820, they were divided up into three blocks of land. North of Dundas Street became known as the Credit Credit Reserve Land. South of Dundas Street became the Credit Indian Reserve, and then straddling Dundas Street in the long narrow strip becomes known as the Racy Tract. Um, most of the land, uh, including the Racy Tract and including the Credit Reserve north of the Racy Tract, all the way up to Eglinton Avenue uh, along the Credit River, they were sold for settlement between 1822 and 1832 as 100-acre 100 lots. Um, and uh, you, you, you tended to, um, by 1832, they are all divvied up, so that's land north of, 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 of the Racy Tract, including where UTM is today, the University of Toronto and Mississauga. Uh, lands within the Racy Tract uh, were, were surveyed as 50 acre lots and a site was set aside both for milling purposes uh, and for a future village site and that future village site would become Arundel Village which is now part of the city of Mississauga. Um, two individuals were set aside as trustees, uh, two British Crown representatives, uh, John Beverly Robinson, who later Sir John Beverly Robinson and uh, Sir Samuel Smith, the Samuel Boy Smith. Uh, were uh, executors of Indian land sales in the Credit River Valley. Uh, the Smith passed away in the mid-1820s. John Beverly continued on in his role until the last land was, set, uh, was, uh, was sold in 1832, and that was the end of John Beverly's involvement here in uh, historical society in the Credit River uh, Valley. So looking at the geographic landscape of it uh, as well, um, you have the blue area in the middle here. This is, um, uh, these are superimposed on uh, the 1877 uh, historic atlas, uh, the map for Toronto Township. It's Eglinton Avenue at the front, Lake Ontario at the bottom, Tobacco Creek all the way over to what is now Winston Churchill. Um, the land in the center in blue, that is the Racy Tract area, centered on the Credit River and Mississauga Road around Dundas Street. 
to the north and immediately to the east. You can see the orange areas, which were part of the credit reserve lands, and then to the south in the red, um, south of the Queensway alignment, this is the credit Indian reserve. Uh, and so this is the land that was conveyed as part of Treaties 22 and 23. Looking at the map today, this is 2019 aerial in the city of Mississauga. You can make out the geographic uh, shapes, if you will, or the, um, the, the rough geographic outline of those treaties of how they uh, were part of our city of Mississauga in, in terms of a landscape perspective. And there are places that it picks through today, uh, places where uh, bends in the survey are still with us on the landscape even 200 years later. Intersections that were, were created when roads were put through uh, in this part of the, of, of the area are still with us today. A number of ways that uh, things peek through, but you kind of have to have uh, look at the land a little differently to kind of see remembrances of these earlier days of, of land use. Uh, the racy tract itself, uh, between uh, located between Arundel Station Road or what was then Station Road, uh, all the way to Fifth Line, uh, Fifth Line West, um, north and south of Dundas Street, 50 acre lots, uh, and smack in the middle was a village site. So what you don't see in here is the location of the Credit River, but you will see an X for a church, and that is St. Peter's Anglican Church at the corner of Dundas Street and Mississauga Road. And then Springfield in the middle, one of the original names for what would become the village of Arendelle. And so a village site was set, up, set aside within the uh, historic lands, uh, historic treaty land, who was then the Racy Tract. Um, who was Thomas Racy? We can go into some depth. I, I like to defend the individual when I can because, again, the one plaque that is to his name kind of erroneously talks about his life and career. Um, Racy was born in England in 1792, uh, immigrated to Canada. He uh, was employed as a clerk and worked his way up. Uh, from there, uh, served in the War of 1812, uh, saw military action in 1812, and attained the rank of captain. Um, after the war, he went into private business down in Niagara, but he was soon called back into, into, into politics, or not politics, sorry, government postings, government jobs. Um, and uh, uh, he was appointed as a Crown land agent, um, principally involved with the selection of mill sites. Uh, it was always important to set aside mill sites in early landscape. Uh, the Crown wanted to control those in terms of uh, making them, uh, developing them into assist for, for local settlers. Um, the Racy Tract in Historic Mississauga was placed under his authority in 1821 with the direct orders to establish a village site. Um, in 1825, uh, he was reassigned as an immigrant agent in Dundas, Ontario, uh, near Hamilton. And then 1833, he became a land registrar for Halton and Wentworth counties which he served in that capacity for 48 years, uh, living in Milton. Um, uh, he passed away in 1881 after a long and lengthy career, a well-respected individual, and was buried in St. Stephen's Anglican Cemetery in Hornby. Um, so a, a remarkable individual, and you can find bits and pieces about him. His, his hand was on the landscape and uh, in a number of different locations in the course of his career. Uh, so Thomas Racy and the Racy Tract are part of the backbone of the uh, settlement within the Credit River Valley. Um, the village is surveyed. Um, this would become the village of Arendelle, but you can see from the, the survey map uh, that was done by William Chewitt, uh, May 21st of 1830, it says plan for the town of Toronto. Uh, it's not a joke. That was the first name that was registered. Uh, this, uh, what is now the city of Toronto was not known as Toronto then in 1830. It was known as York. Uh, York becomes Toronto in 1834. So there's a little bit of a joke of who had the name first. Uh, the answer is black and white on a, on a survey map of 1830. Uh, it's ours. Um, there's a little bit of a joke back in uh, 1968 when the uh, uh, Township of Toronto became the town of Mississauga was they stole our name and we want it back. Uh, that wasn't going to happen at the time, but uh, there it is in black and white uh, in 1830. The uh, plan for the town of Toronto, what would later become Arendelle Village, was laid out by William Chewitt uh, within uh, the, uh, uh, the racy track lands of the Credit River Valley. Um, there is a, 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 a photograph of, uh, of a, a survey map done by uh, Henry Ship Clarkson, uh, March 6th of 1856, which was an extension of the village plot. Um, at that point, the, uh, it's known as the town of Springfield, um, one of many names that the village of Arendelle had historically. One of the important elements of developing a village site was to uh, harness and, uh, and uh, 
develop a mill site. And this is the, one of the rare pictures we have of the McGill flour mill uh, along the Credit River Valley uh, within what is now Arendelle Park today uh, in the flats below Dundas Street. Um, the existence of milling was an important lifeblood to the creation of any historic village, and Arendelle being no different than that. Uh, along Dundas Street, we have historic imagery. Um, one of the, the challenges of these is trying to place them on the modern landscape. Um, in the 1915 picture, uh, in the far distance there, you'll see a steeple rising above the trees. That is St. Peter's Anglican Church at the corner of Dundas Street and, uh, and Mississauga Road. Everything else in the foreground, foreground of those pictures was lost in the fire of 1919. Uh, so a drastic uh, reshaping of the village of Arendelle happened uh, in, the, in the Great Arendelle Fire again in 1919. Um, but that is Dundas Street through both of those pictures, the left one being in 1885 and the right one in 1915, really showing a changed landscape from what we, we see today. But we still drive on that street today, we still pass that church today, just the buildings that appear in this picture are no longer with us. Um, the Royal Exchange Hotel uh, was built as the halfway house in 1819 and it burned 100 years later, again in the fire of, of 1919. Uh, it was the halfway house, uh, as it was called, because it was well, something called halfway. It's halfway to somewhere. Um, this was uh, roughly halfway between the, uh, the the town of York, later the city of Toronto, and Dundas, Ontario, near Hamilton. And this was considered a stopping place for the stagecoaches and the mail along the route. And so Dundas Street became a major east-west road. Again, it's laid out first in 1796 by the Queen's Rangers. Dundas Street becomes a major east-west road of transportation through many historic communities. Known originally and, and somewhat sarcastically as the Governor's Road, and it wasn't a compliment. Um, it was uh, named as such because Dundas Street was ordered by Lieutenant Governor John Graves Simcoe, but it was known to be in very poor repair in its early years. So Governor's Road as a nickname was a little bit sarcastic. Uh, Dundas Street is not named uh, uh, directly after a person, although it carries a person's name. Dundas Street was named because of where it went. Uh, the town itself, town of Dundas, is named, uh, named after Lord Henry Dundas, uh, the British Secretary of War, and essentially uh, John Graves Simcoe's uh, superior. Um, the road that led to that town carries the name Dundas Street to this day. Uh, incidentally, it was a military road, and it was uh, established to go inland to what is now London, Ontario. Uh, and the stretch between Dundas, Ontario and London, Ontario today carries the name Governor's Road uh, in reference to, to this area, but it's the same route of transportation that was laid out as a military road in the 1790s. Um, Arendelle Village, again, you can see the Welcome to Arendelle Village signs on our landscape today, and there were a number of names over its history. It's kind of a village with a bit of an identity crisis, if you will. Um, uh, Toronto Credit Springfield, Springfield on the credit, finally taking the name of Arendelle in 1900 and now, of course, part of the city of Mississauga. Uh, looking at some of the aerials, again, this is the rough aerial of the racy tract itself, so it gives you an idea. Our earliest aerial we have is from 1954. You can kind of see the, the, uh, the development of the Credit Woodlands um, and beginnings of the UTM are there. The Credit River, of course, flowing through the center of it. But, you know, you still see some remnant farmland at the time in the 1950s, but then leaping forward to 2019, and. Arendelle Park sticks out as, uh, as kind of the green space through the center of it and the Credit River still meandering through its course. Arendelle Village uh, located on the south side of Dundas Street right at the bend of Dundas. But you can see the surrounding residential areas that have, been, uh, have grown exponentially in, in the landscape. And of course uh, UTM, a much bigger complex than it is uh, than it was historically. Um, reminders of the past. So one of the things that uh, uh, I like to point out is how we can interact with our, our, our space on our landscape today and, and find those reminders. And this honestly is my favorite picture I've ever taken in the city of Mississauga. I was introduced to the thought of this by uh, Professor Emeritus Thomas McElroy many years ago. But uh, uh, on our landscape today is an intersection, uh, many intersections, mind you, but this is one that still carries those names, uh, reflective of something that happened many, many years ago. Uh, Dundas Street and Fifth Line, uh, Dundas Street West and Fifth Line West, and uh, how do two west roads intersect? Um, it's a little bit of an oddity, if you will, and uh, things that uh, our landscape remembers uh, a bygone era when these things made perfect sense. Uh, Dundas Street is a is a, a, a 
concession road that runs east or west of here on Cario Street. Um, so this is Dundas Street running west. Uh, lines were north-south roads that met at right angles to the concession roads, um, and they were numbered numerically east or west of that center point. So fifth line is simply the fifth north-south road west of the center line, which was center road today, or we know is here on Cario Street. Uh, so even though it is two west roads that intersect, only one of them was actually headed west and another Dundas Street. Uh, fifth line was simply the, the, uh, the fifth line uh, north-south road that intersected with that, uh, that other road. Uh, but uh, I'd be one that champions to, uh, to keep these little reminders of our past. Most of our, our, our north-south roads were numbered, but they have been replaced by names over time. Fifth line is kind of an orphan of that process and never got a name. Um, but uh, I think its name speaks, uh, speaks volumes today in the fun way in which our history is, is reflected on our landscape. Some of the other lines that uh, have been renamed include uh, uh, Tonkin, Cothra, and, uh, and, uh, and Dixie, uh, and of course on the, on the other way uh, we have uh, Winston Churchill still uh, not, no longer retaining its town line status, but also but having a name as of the late 1950s. Uh, but uh, again, the ways in which our landscape remembers of the past. Um, the credit reserve itself, um, uh, these are the lands north of the Racy Tract. Uh, the, they include uh, uh, parts of the UTM campus all the way up to Eglinton Avenue. They were granted for settlement between 1821 and 1832. Uh, a number of the families that uh, settled in this area stayed there for several generations, including the O'Neill, the Featherston, the Harkis family. And, and many of them have uh, their names remembered on the landscape, whether it be street names or uh, uh, largely street names, but uh, in some cases, some of the early families are remembered in park features. Uh, uh, the Silverthorne family is remembered in uh, long-term care facility name up on Mississauga Road and um, uh, remarkable ways that we, we, we connect to the landscape that once that was uh, prior to the modern city coming to be. Um, looking at the Credit Indian Reserve lands themselves, um, this is the land south of the Racy Tract. Uh, the reserve lands were set aside for use by the Mississaugas, uh, but they were gradually um, uh, pushed on all sides by, by uh, non-Indigenous settlers. Um, the red square in the middle re, uh, remembers the 200 acre plot of land that they retained, the Mississaugas retained title to. The village that was built uh, for them and by them uh, in, in partnership with the, the British Crown was not included on the 200 acres, but immediately adjacent to a large portion of that 200 acre land is part of where the Mississauga Golf and Country Club is today on Mississauga Road. Uh, the Credit Mission Village itself, uh, built under the direction of Reverend Peter Jones uh, and uh, Colonel James Gibbons, uh, was uh, in existence along Mississauga Road, or what is Mississauga Road today, between 1826 and 1847. Um, if, uh, if I had to recommend a single book to read uh, out of all the history that's been written on, on the city of Mississauga, I would recommend uh, Sacred Feathers by uh, D Professor Donald Smith. The story of Reverend Peter Jones, a truly, truly remarkable individual who lived in the, the confines of what is now the city of Mississauga, and was remarkable was a remarkable individual at any age and any time in our history. Um, and just a remarkable story of, of what uh, what was attempted to be achieved here um, under the direction of Reverend Peter Jones and others, including his brother John and his uncle Chief Joseph Sawyer. Uh, he was also uh, brought into the, the fold, uh, a young Methodist minister and eventual educator, Egerton Ryerson. Ryerson University carries his name today. There's a, a lot of um, uh, links that have been made to the eventual establishment of the residential school system and, uh, and the times of Egerton Ryerson. Um, there's not a direct link between the two, and that's a, a subject that can be expanded upon further. Uh, Egerton Ryerson, uh, under the direction of Peter Jones, uh, was brought in as, a, as an educator and a minister, um, but uh, Reverend Peter Jones was uh, specific to the instruction of the Mississaugas uh, and gradual conversion, the adoption of Christianity, of course, was, was, was a paramount to that. He was a Christian minister at that time. Um, but uh, also in, in embracing and, and uh, finding harmony between indigenous uh, beliefs uh, and uh, the new Christian Bible and Christian education system, as well as uh, in learning farming practices. It's, it's, it's a, a challenging subject to come to terms with, 
And again, I'd highly recommend uh, Sacred Feathers. Uh, Donald Smith does a remarkable job, much better than I'm doing, on exploring the life and time of, uh, of uh, Reverend Peter Jones. There's a, there's a, a, a fun part of uh, local history. It's kind of one of those things, if you could ever choose a, a person from history to go back in time and uh, you know have a, have a social gathering with or have a drink with, who would you choose? And, of course, there's all those, those giants from history that uh, you go back and, and, and pick your brain, uh, pick, pick their brain, and uh, have a chance to have a conversation with. If I had to choose anyone, uh, so I've been asked that question before. It's uh, it's Reverend Peter Jones, uh, hands down. He, he's the one that uh, I would. Uh, he, he's an individual who walked truly with a foot in both worlds. Um, he was the uh, the grandson of, a, of an Indigenous Mississauga chief and the son of a Welsh surveyor. Um, represented both his, his Mississaugas, but also walked with a foot uh, in in uh, the non-Indigenous world and uh, highly respected in both uh, a passionate and driven individual. And uh, uh, I always say reading uh, Donald Smith's books to me is always like visiting the story of an old friend. Um, uh, and I can't recommend a higher story than that. And, and so, again, perhaps in, in my view, the most significant individual to ever reside within the city of Mississauga, and I fully uh, support the idea of uh, further exploration for anyone who's interested in the story of the life and times of Reverend Peter Jones. Um, the, uh, the Methodist uh, mission, the Credit Mission Village uh, along Mississauga Road, was in existence between 1826 and 1847 when uh, Reverend Peter Jones uh, led his people away from here for a chance to uh, establish themselves on a broader acreage and be able to grow as a people because the confines of the Credit uh, Indian Village, um, uh, Credit uh, Indian Reserve, sorry, and the Credit Mission Village uh, was, was uh, confining to those that would uh, seek to, to uh, Harvest and uh, and uh, uh, farm and greater acreages than the than the Credit Indian Reserve allowed. Um, the village itself, over time, uh, the Credit Mission Village grew, uh, included a hospital, a mechanic shop, two sawmills, eight barns, a harbor warehouse, and twenty houses. Uh, in additional to the first thirty that were built in just ten years, they had about nine hundred acres around them in cultivation. Of course, they only had title to two hundred acres, um, and. Uh, Part of the, what uh, brought money into it from the British Crown perspective was uh, the survey and eventual settlement of what would become Port Credit and the Port Credit Harbor. Um, and uh, the money from those lots was, was, was uh, enabled the village itself to, to benefit from that in, under the direction of the Department of Indian Affairs. Um, ultimately though, uh, it wasn't to be here at the, at the, at the Credit River. Um, uh, any folks, uh, in the spring of 1847, Peter Jones led a majority of the Mississaugas, uh, some 266 Mississaugas, away from the Credit River, ultimately settling south of Hagersville near Brantford, Ontario, at the New Credit Reserve, which many of their descendants live or are and are connected with to this day. Um, land was sold uh, in April of uh, 1847, went up for public auction, and a huge chunk of the land that was a Credit Indian Reserve were purchased by Frederick Chase Capriol and the Peel Manufacturing Company with the intention of building kind of an industrial empire along the, the, uh, the Credit River Valley. Uh, never truly happened, uh, but uh, here is the uh, an 1846 survey of it. Uh, right in the middle where it says Mill Block underneath there, you're going to see the words Indian Village, uh, and that is the site of uh, the Credit Mission Village under the direction of Peter Jones. But you can see the Indian Reserve, uh, the Credit Indian Reserve, it was known as all uh, surveyed out for, uh, for lots for, uh, for non-Indigenous settlement at, uh, at that time in 1846. Um, understanding Port Credit, uh, if you're down in Port Credit today, um, that comes to be on the west side in 1835, known today as the Port Credit Heritage Conservation District, and on the east side in 1846. Um, if you're down in the, uh, the Conservation District on the west side, you're going to find the names of Peter Street and John Street. They are named for Reverend Peter Jones and his brother John Jones, chiefs of the Mississaugas. Uh, the other principal chief at the Credit River at the time was known as Joseph Sawyer, and Mississauga Road, south of Lakeshore Road, was originally known as Joseph Street after Joseph Sawyer. It is now carries the name of Mississauga Road South. Um, but ways in which our landscape remembers and connects to that early period of time can be seen on the Port Credit landscape. 
Um, the Mississauga Golf and Country Club uh, comes to be over 100 years ago. Uh, they have uh, a rich history of their own, and they, they share a, a, a geographic footprint, but not a direct link back to the Mississaugas themselves. The, the land that was the Credit Union Reserve and the uh, Credit Mission Village were purchased by uh, Frederick Chase Capriol and the Peel General Manufacturing Company. And it was from the Capriol estate that the Mississauga Gulf and Country Club purchased its land from, uh, 208 acres in uh, 1906. Uh, Mississauga Road itself on our landscape is uh, connected as an um, early indigenous trail and eventually an early settlers road connecting Dundas Street down to uh, down to the down to the harbor at Fort Credit. Uh, known by a number of names over over its history, including uh, some of the fun ones: uh, Cedar Swamp Road or Cold Spring Road, Springbank Road, uh, Mississauga Street, uh, the Stone Road, uh, the Streetsville Gravel Road. So Plank Road, all kinds of names associated with the Mississauga Road over time. It's only in the 1950s that all these kind of jumbled sections and names are brought together under one banner and becoming, uh, becoming Mississauga Road. Uh, other connections on our landscape involve some of the historic buildings that you can still find within uh, what was uh, the Racy Tract and, uh, and uh, the Credit Reserve lands. Amongst them, a uh, private home, uh, Crozer McNichol House built in 1836, the Robinson Adamson House, uh, the offices of Heritage Mississauga built in 1828, uh, St. Peter's Anglican Church, the first church built in 1826, the present church in 1886 on the same location, uh, and of course the Robert Cotton House, a private home built in 1845, and the former uh, Methodist Church uh, in Port Credit, now the Masonic Lodge, it had been relocated slightly, uh, but it was originally built at the end of the 1830s um, and then remodeled extensively in, uh, in the 19-teens uh, into the Masonic Lodge we see today. But, uh, you know, history is all around us. Uh, many reminders of our past. This is only a scattering of them. There's many more as well. But the, the landscape remembers. Uh, and, and you just have to know ways to, to look at it and, and uh, kind of have the different eyes to see those remembrances of the past that are on our landscape. Along Mississauga Road near the entrance to the Mississauga Gulf and Country Club today, you're going to find Chitwa Tigans, the Sacred Garden, uh, which is a, um, uh, an Indigenous uh, uh, commemoration site for the Credit Mission Village. Um, and uh, some people think it's oddly situated along Mississauga Road, uh, tight confines, but you'll see from the map that the garden itself was located directly in the middle of what was the Credit Mission Village site itself. Um, and with that, we'll, uh, we'll close uh, kind of our, our, our trip down memory lane in commemoration and remembrances of treaties 22 and 23 that were signed 200 years ago this year and how our landscape remembers and connects to uh, the, this, this moment from our history. And uh, we look forward to uh, exploring and sharing other topics of local history with you in, uh, in the weeks ahead. So uh, thank you and be well. Uh, and thank you for joining us here at Heritage Mississauga.